Let us pray and ask for a blessing on this worship service. Heavenly Father, eternal God, we come before you with thankfulness that we may draw near to you to worship you in your presence. Lord, you are a holy God, and we by nature are sinful, yet you have graced us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this privilege that you may make us right before you in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have forgiveness of sins through his ransom that was made for us on the cross. Continue to sanctify us before you so that we may live a life that is pleasing to you. We pray also that we may worship you as well in a way which is pleasing in your sight, in spirit, and truth. We thank you that despite the circumstances in this country and this world, that we may still be together as a congregation, be it here present or from our homes. We pray that everyone who is connected to this service may receive a rich blessing, may rejoice in the Lord, and may join us in worship of your great and holy name. Bless us in, worship, in this worship service. Help us in listening and speaking, that we may grow in faith and grow in our love and devotion to you, as you have set us apart as your people to praise and glorify your name. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This afternoon, we shall read from God's Word from two passages, the first being Colossians 1, verses 1 through 23, the second being Psalm 11. After the reading of the Word, we shall sing from Psalm 7, verses 1 and 3. Colossians 1, starting at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, 
who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's turn now to Psalm 11. Psalm 11, to the choir master of David, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the nations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching, scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face.
text for the preaching this afternoon comes from the same psalm we read, Psalm 11, verse 3, which reads as follows. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. From a human perspective, life on planet Earth is far from stable. I am sure we can all attest to that. Life can change quickly from one week to the next, even one day to the next. Neither does it take much for a society to collapse and fall. If you have a rudimentary knowledge of world history, you will know that empires and cultures collapse with regularity and sometimes very swiftly. In many cases, historians don't even know what happened to certain cultures and empires beyond the fact that they disappeared. In Canada, our present generation, and grandparents too, have enjoyed freedom and prosperity and civil liberty for many decades. But as we've experienced over the past few months, it doesn't take much for a society to be brought to a standstill. Furthermore, it wouldn't be an overstatement to say that the moral fabric of our society is disintegrating. The God-ordained foundation of the family is being undermined. The number of single-parent families is on the rise. Our society believes it can redefine the meaning of the institution of marriage. Abortion is considered a procedure by which you can get rid of the inconvenience. Homosexuality is applauded. Transgenderism is celebrated. But it doesn't stop there. Even though on many fronts our Western society preaches tolerance, violence and discrimination have certainly not disappeared. Racial tension triggers reactions resulting in riots and protests in cities all over North America. There is so much injustice. So often the weak are acquitted, the poor are exploited, the veneer of civilization is very thin, and the foundations of society are easily destroyed. In many places on earth, Life is treated as if it's very cheap. Ethnic cleansing has been the scourge of the last century. Even today, it continues in many parts of the world. So what are we to do? How should believers react? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? This is the question David is faced with in the circumstances in which is he in which he is being told that he better flee for his life because that's the only thing left for him to do. In this psalm, we find David's God-inspired reply to that question. If the foundations are destroyed, the righteous look, to, look in faith to the Lord. We'll first look at the trust of faith, second, the test of faith, third, the testimony of faith, and fourth, the assurance of faith. David begins with an emphatic declaration of his trust in the Lord. In the Lord I take refuge. This is his confession of faith. He is committing to keep, committed to keeping this trust. And you probably noted that David uses the covenant name covenant name Yahweh, which is rendered in all caps in English. This is the name God gave for himself to Moses, I am who I am. This name signifies the Lord is all-sufficient and self-sufficient. He is in need of nothing. We cannot bring anything to him to make him better, and yet we need him for everything. He is autonomous, immutable, that is, he is self-sustaining, and he does not change. His word does not change. His promises remain the same, and his character never shifts. 
I take refuge in the Lord, says David. The Lord is his confidence, his stronghold and his fortress. The Lord says through Isaiah, even if the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Isaiah 54 verse 10. And this is what David believes as well. He does not trust in chariots or horses, Psalm 20, verse 7. He does not trust in man alone, but he trusts in God alone, Psalm 146. David is not adrift on the ocean of political upheaval, but he is anchored in God. He knows where his trust can be placed, and that's true for us as well. We believe in the same God. Our God is Yahweh, the faithful God, he is our anchor in the storms of life. He is our security. And as New Testament believers, we have a richer assurance than David did. For we know that the great son of David, Jesus Christ, sits on the throne of heaven as eternal king. Jesus Christ, through whom we have redemption, and by whom we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, this Jesus reigns, at the right hand of God the Father. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the of the body, the church. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 18. Jesus Christ reigns as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. In everything, he is preeminent and he rules all things for the sake of his church. He is reconciling all things to himself, whether in heaven or on earth. And that means that everything that happens on earth, including the violence, the racial tensions, the injustice and the corruption, and all the political upheavals, these are being directed by him, controlled by him, limited by him, and used by him as he is rec reconciling all things to himself. God has put everything under his feet and made him head over everything for the sake of the church. Therefore, we confess what David confessed. In the Lord, I take refuge. The Lord is our refuge. Jesus Christ is our hope. And this is true for every believer. And it's true for us personally and presently, today and tomorrow. And he is our exclusive hope. In the midst of trouble and turmoil, our steadfast anchor and hope is the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is the living God who is and who was and who is coming. He is the first and he is the last and there is no God besides him. We do not trust in governments or in the police force. We do not pin our hopes on medical experts. We pray for them, we work with them, we will follow their orders when we need to but our trust is in God alone. And our security is not found in the stock market or in our personal resume. We do not pin our hopes on having a good education. We can use these things, but we will not trust in them. All these things have failed in the past and will fail again. There is only one who does not fail. There is only one to whom we pray. There is only one who holds our hands, pardon me, our lives in his hands. There is only one who ordains and orders all things. There is only one who is sovereign. There is only one who loves us with a love and faithfulness that stretches the furthest limits of our imagination. In the Lord I take refuge. This is where the psalm begins. This is David's trust. This is where we begin, whether we are new parents or receiving another child, whether we are becoming office bearers for the first time 
or being ordained for another term. In the Lord I take refuge, in him we trust. But this is a trust that is often tested. Obviously there were around David those who did not trust. David goes on to say, how can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain, verse 1b. For David, this is a test of faith. This is the advice from those who are close to David. This is not the advice of an enemy, but the advice of a friend. The advice of those who do not want to see David shot at by those wicked men as described in verse 2. But these advisors are speaking from a human perspective. They are saying, take flight, flee, get while the getting is still good, protect yourself, flee like a bird to your mountain. But David says, how can you speak to me in this way? How can you expect me to flee like a startled bird? Birds take flight at the slightest noise or disturbance. How can you expect me to run, to withdraw, to forget about my responsibilities? Why are David's advisors telling him to flee? Look at verse 2. For behold, the wicked bend the bow. See what's happening. The wicked are make ready, making ready to attack, ready to attack from ambush. They have arrows ready to shoot. And they are cunning and cowardly, only brave in the dark. So they are armed and dangerous. And they prey on the defenseless. This is what David's advisors see. So they say, protect yourself. We shouldn't miss that behind this advice lies the assumption that the self, that self-preservation is all important, that personal safety is all important. But when you think this way, then you have crossed the line into idolatry. That doesn't mean, of course, that we should never take precautions as we are doing or have done during the restriction placed on us, or that we are allowed to be reckless with our lives or our health, with our families or even our possessions. But self-preservation may never be our top priority. David's advisors see the problem, but they have the wrong solution. They are telling him to make an idol of his personal security. All they see is a hopeless situation. They say, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the social order is being destroyed, what can we do? If stability and security is not what it was, if justice is no longer to be found, if all this is destroyed, what can we do? We need to be able to answer this question too. And where do we go for an answer to such a question? We go to the Word of God, the living and abiding Word of God, because it is the most powerful reality in this world and it provides us with the answers we need. That answer is found in this psalm in verse 4. This is David's response to his fearful friends. This is his testimony. The Lord is in his holy temple. Don't look around, but look up. Don't look at what is going on around you, but look up where God is. David isn't talking about the temple in Jerusalem, but the place where God dwells. The Lord's throne is in the heaven. Verse 4b. That is the place where worship occurs. There the Lord is surrounded by myriads and myriads of angels singing his praises. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah 6, Psalm 57, verse 5, and Revelation 5. David's testimony is that we need to look up, that we should be doing what we always must be doing. We must praise and worship God, whose throne is in heaven. He is the only sovereign God who reigns in majesty and glory. Just think about what was revealed to the Apostle John as described in the book of Revelation in chapter 4. In a vision, John was caught up to heaven and he saw wonderful things. But the thing that captured his attention was the throne and him who sat on it. 
Esau, heaven and earth rejoice in that reality. The reality is that on a throne in heaven is a ruler. And regardless of social upheaval and political turmoil, there is a God in heaven, and he is still on his throne and working for our good. What, that, what the wicked intend for evil, God works for good. And God's plans are never thwarted. God has a plan, and he does not need a plan B. He has never been surprised by anything that happens. He always knows what he is doing. What looks to us like utter chaos, upheaval, and disorder, it all makes sense to God. And so we have a message. The church has a message for the world. We can use disruptions in society. We can use political turmoil and economic disasters and pandemics as opportunities to proclaim the Lord's sovereignty and the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Nothing is in our control, and yet nothing is out of control because God is in control. There is not even one molecule running maverick in this world. God reigns over every single one of them. This is the testimony of faith. That is the message we need to hear and we need to proclaim. The Lord is in his temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. He rules over all. Psalm 103, verse 19. Our God is in the heavens, and he does whatever pleases him. Psalm 115, verse 3. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all peoples. Psalm 99, verse 2. And he rules for his people. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 100, verse 3. This is David's testimony, and it should be ours too. God is on his holy throne, and Jesus reigns as king from heaven. But David's testimony doesn't end there. See verse 4b. God sees all the evil. He sees the wicked. He sees them even in the darkness. He sees their arrows, their hearts, and their evil plans. God also sees the things that are happening in our world today. There are many things in the world that make us concerned. Things like superpowers jockeying for do dominance in the world. Conspiracy theories about what's going on in the world today in relation to the coronavirus pandemic. Or the fact that our culture is becoming increasingly hostile to Christ and his church. How should we deal with our concerns in such matters? Of course, if we see injustice, we should speak out. Of course, if we see government officials acting in ways that are not in accord with God's will, then we should warn them and pray for them. But if we see them trying to act in the best interest of the citizens, we should not resort to grumbling and complaining even if we think they could do things differently. All too often, we get all bent out of shape grumbling and complaining about our government instead of praying for our leaders. Let's keep in mind that our citizenship is in heaven. Our allegiance is to Christ. The world as we know it is destined to be refined by fire. You could even say that it's already on fire, but too, all too often we add fuel to the fire instead of acting like firefighters. All too often we get so terribly bent out of shape about things happening in the world and how things affect us personally. We are easily provoked by the actions of our own governments. How are we acting differently than the wicked? Are we acting like citizens of this world or citizens of heaven? Are we forgetting that God sees everything? Are we forgetting that nothing goes undetected by him? Do you not know that he sees everything that bothers you? And you can be sure that injustice and wickedness and government, government wastefulness bothers him a lot more than they bother you and me. He sees it all. 
When David refers to the Lord's eyelids, he's using a Hebrew expression to say that the Lord's gaze upon us is intense. It is penetrating. He is probing the children of man with his gaze. Psalm 33, verses 13 to 15 says, The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the heart of them all and observes all their deeds. Psalm 14, verse 2 says, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. Hebrews 4, 4 verse 13 says that nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and exposed before the eyes of him to whom everyone must give account. Do we sometimes forget that the judge of the earth is looking down on mankind and that he tests the righteous and judges the wicked? And when the Lord tests, it means something like putting metal ore into a fire to separate the pure metal from the impurities. God sees the difference between the wheat and the tares, and he hates those who love violence. And what does that tell us about God? That's a long way from be happy and smile because God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. This is a holy God who cannot abide evil. Everything in him is repulsed by evil. Psalm 5 says that God does not delight in wickedness, that he hates all evildoers and will destroy those who speak lies. It's true that God does not take pleasure in the death of sinners. Ezekiel 18 verse 23 and also chapter 33 verse 11. But there is more to God than just his love. There is more to the story than life everlasting in heaven. The Lord hates those who practice wickedness and his word tells us that he will judge them. Psalm 7 verse 6 says that God has appointed a judgment and in verse 11 we read that he is a righteous judge who feels indignation every day. God will not just be angry at the wicked on judgment day but he is angry with them every day. And according to Psalm 7 verse 12 if a man does not repent God will wet his sword he has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. This is the Lord's response to the evildoers who bend their bow. He will bend his bow, and you can be sure that God never misses his target. And so what that means for us is that you and I do not have to take vengeance into our own hands. God will deal with the wicked and those who love violence and practice injustice. The Lord is enthroned in heaven, and that is the vision of faith. That is the testimony of faith. This is David's response to the question, what can the righteous do? The righteous put their trust in God. The righteous trust that God will exact justice. The judge of all the earth will do what is right. Psalm 11 verse 6 tells us God will rain fire and brimstone on the wicked, on the wicked of verse 2. Fire and brimstone is part of the message of scripture. In the end, God will make the wicked drink from the eternal fires of hell. That will be their portion and their cup. The point David makes is pretty straightforward. We do not need to, re to overreact to the evil actions of the wicked. The Lord says, vengeance is mine, Romans 12, verse 19. And the Bible says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10, verse 31. The Lord tells us, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell, Matthew 10, verse 28. Even if the chaos and wickedness and violence in the world would result in the loss of our property and the loss of our freedom and even the loss of our very lives, we have this assurance. The Lord reigns and everything is okay. It really is. If our trust is in the judge of heaven and earth, then we can truly confess it is well with my soul and it will be well with me. 
the Apostle John was writing to the seven churches in Asia who were experiencing great persecution. And when he describes his vision in Revelations, Revelation 4, he uses the word throne 12 times in that chapter. Why would he do that? To encourage his readers to remain steadfast in the face of suffering and in the face of chaos and societal turmoil. The Lord is in his holy temple, therefore we will not fear. Instead, God's people rejoice and worship him who sits on the throne. That's the reaction we find later in the book of Revelation after John describes the judgment of God over the great whore called Babylon in Revelation 18. Right after that we read, there is great rejoicing in heaven. That's when you hear singing and, a wor and worship and hallelujahs and then the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is how history is going to end. World leaders come and go. Governments and empires and cultures rise and fall. But the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Revelation 11, verse 15. The Lord's throne is in heaven. That is the testimony of faith. This is our response to the question, what can the righteous do? We consider what's happening around us, but we look up. We always look up. And this testimony gives us great assurance. David writes in 11 verse 7, the Lord is righteous. The Lord will judge every sin in the world. No sin will ever be swept under the carpet. Every single sin ever committed is either punished in hell or pardoned in Christ. For the Lord is righteous and he loves righteous deeds and therefore the upright shall behold his face. That is the assurance of the testimony of faith. The upright will behold his faith. There is a rich promise in those last words of Psalm 11 that is both true for today and for the future. We don't just care about personal safety, but we care about having a relationship with our Lord who sits on heaven's throne. We don't just want God's protection, but we want to be near to him. We want communion with God. And we have that now already, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. We have never seen Jesus, but we would gladly confess that we love him. With the eyes of faith, we see that he is on the throne, even in the midst of chaos and turmoil and violence. With the eyes of faith, we know that one day we will see him face to face. When Jesus returns, we will behold the face of God. Revelations 22, verse 3 and following. What a day that will be. On that day, all the wicked who bend the, who bend the bow to fling arrows at the righteous will have to bend the knee and acknowledge Christ as king. On that day, things will be different from the, things, from the way things are now and from when Christ first came to earth. When Jesus came the first time, he was riding a lowly donkey. When he comes again, he will be riding a white horse. The first time he came, he wore a crown of thorns. When he comes again, he will be wearing a crown with many diadems. The first time he came, he bowed his head and was led as a lamb to the slaughter. When he comes again, he will break the nations with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 2 verse 9. The first time he came, he suffered injustice, but when he comes again, he will execute justice. The first time he came, he stood before Pilate. When he comes again, Pilate will stand before him. Today, God's people are often despised and persecuted, but on that day, the faithful and elect will be crowned with glory and honor before the eyes of their persecutors. Today, we often get the short end of the stick, but the Lord is on his throne, and from heaven his eyes see, and his eyelids test the children of men. And so we do not have to flee like frightened birds, neither do we have to take vengeance. Instead, let us be peacemakers, 
and messengers of the gospel, for that is our calling. We live in circumstances that are similar to what God's people have experienced before. May the Psalm of David strengthen and encourage us. May the trust and testimony and the assurance expressed in the psalm be yours. And may this testimony and this assurance help each one of us as we live each day in a world of turmoil, chaos, and wickedness. May it help all of us as we live as citizens in a world where the foundations are often destroyed, but at the same time a world in which we know that the Lord is on his throne. Amen.